May 29, 1850, eight miles northwest of present-day Alice, Texas. Captain John Rip Ford and his contingent of Texas Rangers are making their way down a tributary of the Nueces River. They were on their way south, toward their headquarters at San Antonio Viejo, or Old San Antonio, near the U.S.-Mexico border on the Rio Grande. Captain Ford, known as Rip, which many apocryphal accounts attribute to his signing of so many death notices while serving as a quartermaster in the Mexican-American War from 1846 to 1848, has just celebrated his 35th birthday. He is joined by several other veterans of the war, all of whom are in their 20s and early 30s. Second in command is Lieutenant Andrew Jackson Walker. Malchiah Benjamin Highsmith serves as quartermaster and commissary. David Level serves as orderly, and Philip N. Luckett serves as the surgeon. Though young, all have considerable combat experience in the brutal conflicts of the Mexican-American War. A number of other rangers rounded out their ranks, including William Gillespie. Gillespie, a relatively new ranger, had also served in the Mexican-American War and came from a family who held a revered and respected place in the ranger history. His uncle, Robert Gillespie, had served with distinction along with ranger legends such as Jack Hayes, Bigfoot Wallace, Samuel Walker, and Rip Ford himself. Robert Addison Gillespie, known as Addy to his friends, had served with distinction in countless campaigns against the Comanche. He had met his end four years earlier while serving in the Mexican-American War. On September 22, 1846, in the Battle of Monterey, the elder Gillespie had reportedly been the first ranger to breach the perimeter of the fort on Independence Hill. During the action, he was shot in the torso and mortally wounded. He would succumb to his wound a day later, on September 23rd. William Gillespie, determined to follow in his legendary uncle's footsteps, was keen to engage the Comanche and solidify his own reputation with the rangers. The ranger's lead scout is a half Comanche, half Mexican man named Rocco Magricio, who spoke three languages, Spanish, English, and Comanche, and was thoroughly familiar with the territory they were in near the Nueces River. He was also reputed to have an otherworldly sense of smell. Despite the highly desirable skill set of their scout, they had spent much of the previous fall in pursuing specter-like bands of Comanche in vain all throughout South Texas. They had, in fact, not even seen any Comanche in many months. This had been a source of great frustration for Ford, certainly, but even more so for the young and battle-hungry amongst them, like William Gillespie. During this spring, though, combat with the Comanche had seemed a more and more certain prospect. Their first contact would come as a shock, though, when they were startled awake on May 26th by the gunshot of a ranger posted as sentry. His intended target had been a group of shadowy figures astride several of the ranger's horses, riding away from the herd at a full gallop. After the riders did not halt at the sentry's orders, the ranger opened fire, hitting one unfortunate rider in the torso and knocking him to the ground. Until the sun broke on the eastern horizon, no ranger left the perimeter of the camp for fear of being caught in an ambush in the dark. However, once dawn broke, the group was sent out to retrieve the unidentified would-be horse thief. They returned to camp soon after, bearing with them the barely alive body of a teenage Comanche warrior. He had been part of a group of young warriors intent on stealing the Texans' horses, garnering themselves a measure of material wealth and social renown. Though his cohorts had managed to escape, this unfortunate young man had been mortally wounded by the sentry's shot. As he expired, the rangers rode out of camp and reconnoitered an area several miles in circumference, finding none of the unfortunate young warrior's companions. Later that day, Captain Ford scribbled a note detailing their location and contact with the Comanches and requesting reinforcements. He dispatched another eventual ranger legend, Edward Burleson Jr., to carry the message to the nearby Fort Merrill. Burleson departed and later returned that afternoon, reporting of a dismal, even downright disturbing state of affairs at the fort. The commander, J.B. Plummer, seemed not only unconcerned with the potential danger, but also upset with the rangers for their early morning gunshots disturbing his troopers' sleep. Plummer dismissed the reports of Comanche being so close to the fort, despite the tangible proof of a dying prisoner in the custody of the rangers. 
his reticent agreement to send a small detachment of his regulars back to the ranger camp with Burleson only resulted in the already bizarre situation deteriorating into the macabre. That night, one of the regulars wandered about the camp, toting the head of the recently deceased Comanche as a trophy. Even for the veteran rangers, and especially for their neophyte brethren, such a sight was both disgusting and distasteful. Ford described the man as loony and sent the regulars away upon being made aware of the reprehensible display. Now, three days later, as they made their way south, their eyes always scanning the brush and horizon for potential dangers, many among them desired only to exit this territory and secure a few days respite within the walls of San Antonio Viejo. Once ensconced within the comparative safety of sturdy, cool adobe walls and tempering their nerves with a stiff drink, perhaps their minds could unwind enough to process the events of the preceding 72 hours. But San Antonio Viejo was still a long ride up the Nueces from here, and whether the rangers knew it or not, there would be no respite from violence and danger anywhere in their near future. For, though the Texas frontier was a vast expanse of territory that did not always lend itself to ease in travel nor communication, word did spread fast. And word had spread to the Comanche, via the survivors of the failed raid on the ranger encampment, that the Texians had inflicted a hard death on one of their beloved tribesmen. Though the Comanche could be harsh, unremitting, and even overtly inhumane to even the most innocent of their enemy, Comanche families and bands were incredibly close and unyieldingly sentimental. As was common amongst many Plains tribes, the Comanche ceremonial grieving process often involved self-mortification that could at times even result in the death of the practitioner. The Comanche, though, perhaps more than any tribe, managed to perpetually strike a Newtonian balance in avenging wrongs done to them. That is to say, to whatever degree they perceived themselves to have been aggrieved, it was their right, nigh their karmic duty, to seek vengeance via an equal and opposite degree of violence. The rangers were all too aware of the Comanche's propensity for combat, and thus a tense anticipation pervaded their ranks as they rode south. For better or for worse, though, they would not have to suffer the pangs of dread long. They had broke camp at dawn, and by mid-morning, their scout, Roquet, had spotted the tracks of several unshod horses, sign of a war party being nearby. The Comanche would have been aware of the party's likely destination, as it was the only fort on the Nueces between their current location and the fort they had just left. Thus, Ford and his rangers assumed, correctly, as it would turn out, that the Comanche intended to cut off their current path of travel. With the Comanche, and thereby mortal danger near at hand, thoughts of relaxing in a border cantina or reposing in a warm bed at their destination were quickly replaced with the immediate demands of combat. Their first engagement saw them being fired upon by a small party of Comanche attackers, another small group of younger braves out reconnoitering the territory. The attackers were quickly disconcerted by the firepower of the ranger contingent. By 1850, the rangers, though only a decade and a half old, had already contributed significantly to advancements in firearm technology. The intervening time had seen the average ranger outfitted at first with single-shot pistols, then five-shot Patterson Colt revolvers with removable cylinders, two, at this time, the most recent iteration of the Colt revolver, the 1847 Walker Colt. Its predecessor, the Patterson Colt, had been the brainchild of a young New Jersey inventor named Samuel Colt. Colt had first designed the pistol with its revolving cylinder in 1836. Though the implementation of a revolving cylinder was not invented by Samuel Colt, his hope was to bring the concept to its fullest fruition. Though at first it seemed there was no commercial interest in his invention, it would be the burgeoning Republic of Texas who would be an early purchaser of the firearm. In 1839, the Republic would officially purchase 180 of the revolvers for use by, of all things, the Texas Navy. At the time, pirates did frequent the coast of Texas, and the Republic needed to defend itself against possible international incursions now that it was, for the time being, operating as an autonomous entity. However, Governor Sam Houston would disband them in 1843, 
freeing up the stocks of now unused revolvers for Texas's newest military experiment, the Texas Rangers. The Rangers, who traced their lineage to Stephen F. Austin's ranging companies of the 1830s, were a motley assemblage of combative and adventurous young men whom Texas sought to employ as a light-mounted cavalry. In the intervening years, both the Rangers and the revolver would be pit through the refiner's fire of hard, frequent, and highly mobile combat engagements with adversaries ranging from cattle thieves to Mexican soldiers to Comanche warriors. Colt even struck up a correspondence and eventual friendship with Ranger Samuel Walker in which the Ranger related suggestions for improvements and letters oftentimes written not far from the front lines. Walker was a Maryland native who had come to Texas in 1842 via the port at Galveston. He had served under Captain Jesse Billingsley in an ill-fated invasion into Mexico, only to be captured, held as a POW, and narrowly survive what is known to history as the Black Bean Incident, linked to episode and description. Upon returning to Texas, Walker enlisted with the Rangers, and via his experiences in fighting the Comanche, Kiowa, Apache, and in the Mexican-American War, he would come to suggest adding a fixed trigger guard, interchangeable parts for easier repair in the field, and, perhaps most distinctively, adding one chamber to the cylinder, making it a six-shot revolver. The finished product, what would come to be known as the Colt Walker revolver, would weigh in at 4.5 pounds, with a length of nearly a foot and a quarter, firing a 44 caliber ball with an effective range of roughly 100 yards. This made the Colt Walker what amounted to a handheld cannon, especially by the standards of the time. Rip Ford himself, who served with Samuel Walker throughout many of the same campaigns, including the Battle of Veracruz, remarked that the pistol was indeed more powerful than the 54 caliber Mississippi rifle after seeing its lethality at distance in combat. The Rangers quickly adopted the new revolvers in 1847, and Walker himself would carry two into combat late that year at the Battle of Huamantla. It would be here on October 9, 1847, that the young Ranger captain would be shot and killed by a sniper. Though Walker had fallen, his legacy and the legacy of the firearm he had helped to build were still keenly felt just over two years later here on the Nueces River. Rip Ford and the countless other veterans of the war in which Walker perished no doubt felt an extra measure of gratitude for his efforts now that they found themselves surrounded and far from home. The Walker cult enabled them to lay down a field and rate of fire that could overwhelm the rate of fire that the Comanche were capable of with their short, high draw weight bows. The Comanche had long dominated the battlefield in terms of rate of fire and maneuverability, two key factors in any engagement. The horsemanship of the average Comanche warrior enabled him to fire his weapon while hanging off the side of the horse, protected from counterfire by the animal's body. He could loose his arrow from over the horse's back, as well as under or over the horse's neck, all while shielding himself from consequential counterattack. These skills were not inherent in the Comanche more than any other people. The difference lie in their lifestyle and training. The Comanche were highly practiced from very young ages at skill sets that would eventually stack together to present the fully formed, fully grown warrior that ruled the southern plains. Comanche children, boys and girls, were taught to ride and to shoot. Common practice drills involved picking up objects off the ground while riding their horses at progressively faster speeds upon every attempt, as well as shooting live birds out of the air with blunted arrows as a means of target practice. But the rangers, for all their reputation as an ad hoc assemblage of killers for hire, were in fact disciplined, drilled professionals who were not only superb horsemen, but incredibly accurate marksmen while mounted, as well as sound, small group tacticians. And the rangers were not only well armed, but mounted on some of the finest horses in Texas. A prospective ranger was not allowed to join the ranks with a horse valued at less than $100. Adjusted for inflation, this would be a cost of roughly $3,900 today. The rangers were indeed known for their decided lack of military discipline, dress, and decorum. They were free to wear what pleased them, from wide-brimmed hats and serapes to buckskin leggings and coonskin caps. But in combat, they were highly disciplined, highly mobile, and highly dangerous. In 1850, they were essentially the only military force capable of engaging the Comanche 
on the Comanche's level. On this day, though, that premise would be certainly put to the test. After their initial skirmish near what was known as Rancho Amagosa, Ford ordered his men into skirmish lines spaced out a few yards apart and the contingent carried on, Colt Walker revolvers drawn and ready. They moved as quietly as possible, communicating via either hand signs or in the most hushed of tones. They would travel another four miles up the Nueces before coming in sight of the Comanche's camp near what is known as Agua Dulce Creek. The Comanche that had attacked them earlier had disappeared to the north and had evidently not yet returned to their camp to sound the alarm that the rangers were on their way. This delay meant the rangers possessed the element of surprise and Rip Ford sought to use that advantage to its fullest extent immediately. With Ford leading the charge, the rangers rode full speed towards the unsuspecting war party's camp. The Comanche in camp, soon sensing the oncoming commotion of hoofbeats and riders' exhortations, snatched up their weapons and made a mad dash for their horses. Seconds later, the rangers would smash into the Comanche camp at full force. Now riding at top speed and loosing howling war cries of their own, the rangers barreled in amongst the Comanche, shooting down any and all that they could at first sight. No exception was made for the mounts of the Comanche either, as several of them were shot down at point-blank range in order to bring their rider to the ground. Over the course of the next few minutes, a brutal close-quarters combat would unfold throughout the camp with some warriors standing to fight and others attempting to escape into the mesquite brush that surrounded them. Those who stood and fought were almost all shot down where they stood, while those who retreated into the brush were pursued by mounted rangers intent on killing them. When the dust had settled, Rip Ford's rangers had killed four of the Comanche warriors in the camp and, by Ford's account, wounded up to seven. In the immediate aftermath, many of the rangers were flush with the thrill of victory and shouts of triumph and congratulations abounded. Then, they heard the screams. In all the commotion, despite what any of them would consider a resounding victory, one of their own had been gravely wounded. Young William Gillespie had been riding through the village on the attack, bringing up the rear as a younger ranger. Ahead of him, he saw a Comanche warrior attempting to flee the village on horseback. The warrior was, however, brought down in quick succession by a shot to the neck and an additional shot to the back. Gillespie watched the warrior fall from his horse, presuming him to be dead as he rode past. But, though mortally wounded, the warrior was not dead. The warrior had managed to bring himself up to a sitting position after Gillespie had ridden by him. Seeing this, Gillespie wheeled his horse around in an effort to shoot the fallen Comanche with his revolver. However, the animal lurched and caused the young man to misfire into the ground between himself and the Comanche. This momentary mishap created all the time the Comanche warrior needed to draw his bow one final time and, before expiring of his own wounds, loose an arrow that struck Gillespie under the ribcage piercing his lung. Mortally wounded, the ranger slumped in the saddle. Seeing this, Captain Ford called his rangers off the pursuit of the fleeing Comanche and into two squads. One squad formed a defensive line to shield the second, who ushered Gillespie, still slumped in his saddle, to safety. For a tense moment, the fleeing Comanche turned and seemed to ponder an attack on the now compromised rangers, who had just done them so much harm and killed four of their own. However, they were not afforded much time in contemplation as the ranger squad holding the defensive position soon burst into a headlong attack towards them. The Comanche fled into the mesquite, leaving their wounded to the mercy of the rangers. Once outside the effective range of the rangers' firearms, though, the remaining Comanche would continue to taunt and torment the rangers from afar, shielded from sight by the brush and darkness. Meanwhile, the rangers had commandeered what was the Comanche camp only a short time earlier and turned it into the closest approximation to a field hospital as they were able. Their efforts would do little good though. Gillespie's wound was severe, with the arrow penetrating deep into his ribcage. In the succeeding hours, he would die a slow, agonizing death. Gillespie was much beloved amongst his cohorts, and the fact that his legendary uncle had suffered such a similar, terrifying fate only a few short years before was not lost on any of the rangers present. But their work was not done. 
those not tending to Gillespie were sent out to inspect and treat the horses, many of whom had been injured in the fight. Others were sent out to scout the perimeter of the camp on the lookout for any lingering Comanche. These rangers returned soon after with a young Comanche who had been injured in the fight and hidden in the brush. The boy had been hit twice by gunshots in the arm, but, much to the ranger's surprise and admiration, remained silent and stoic since being discovered. The boy apparently assumed that he would be taken to the ranger's chief and summarily executed. When he was informed that he would in fact not be harmed, he remained dubious but peaceable. The young man informed the rangers that he was the son of a war chief and that his people had bestowed upon him the rather unfortunate moniker of Carne Muerto, or dead meat. Were it not for the present circumstances, the bizarre nature of this scenario might have provided some much needed levity. But as the mortally wounded William Gillespie writhed in pain only a few yards away, there was no laughter to be had. The rangers made camp and endured a restless, agonizing night, one that their friend and compatriot Gillespie would not survive. Some time before the sun rose, the young ranger, who had dreamed of serving proudly and solidifying his own legend, passed away. Captain Ford, who no doubt bore a considerable amount of grief and guilt, having long known the Gillespie family, ordered the young man's body tied to a mule. The rangers then made their way to the top of a small hill near Aguadulce Creek, where a grave was dug, and Gillespie was wrapped in a blanket, still wearing his boots, still with his hat on. What Ford himself described as a sad but simple service was held, with prayers offered and scriptures read. All the while, the young Comanche captive, who had been brought along in tow, stared silently at the open grave that had been dug. Like most Comanche, he would have been all too aware that the rangers had a reputation for exacting harsh revenge of their own on their prisoners. And he believed that, after the death of their comrade, the rangers now meant to kill him in retribution and bury him in the grave. He was, however, informed that this would not be the case. Gillespie's body was then lowered as gently as possible into the grave, covered with rocks to dissuade the wolves and coyotes, and then the rangers moved on, heading again towards San Antonio Viejo, with one less ranger and one more prisoner in tow. They would indeed make it to San Antonio Viejo. But the story of the rangers fighting the mighty Comanche here in the unforgiving Texas frontier was far from over. Rip Ford and many of the men present that day would go on to legendary careers with the rangers. Though the fate of Carno Muerte, the young Comanche brave taken prisoner, is lost to history, the fate of Comanches was far from determined. Their reign as lords of the southern plains would continue on for at least a quarter century more, as would the tales of horrific raids, merciless battles, and the ongoing fight to hold on to the territory they believed to be rightfully theirs. But those, like the countless other stories from the Old West, are other stories for other times. <laughs>